The operating system that powers every Apple computer is called Mac OS, and if you haven't used Apple products for very long, you may not be familiar with the operating system's history. The first version was released in 1984 and completely changed the computer industry, similar to how iOS on the first iPhone completely changed the smartphone industry. But the history of Mac OS spans a number of decades, which has resulted in the operating system appearing and behaving much differently today than it had over 30 years ago. So in this video, we're going to explore some of the biggest transformations and most dramatic moments Mac OS has experienced in its lifetime. This is Greg with Apple Explained, and I want to thank MacPaw for sponsoring this video. If you want to help decide which topics I cover, make sure you're subscribed, and these voting polls will show up in your mobile activity feed. Now, the history of Mac OS goes back to 1984, when Apple introduced the Macintosh. It was the first commercial computer to feature a graphical user interface and a mouse, which made the machine much easier to use and therefore more accessible to non-tech users. Previously, using a computer meant understanding the abbreviated textual commands needed to interact with the command line interface of an Apple II or IBM PC, which typically only tech hobbyists were familiar with. But the introduction of a graphical user interface changed everything. You no longer needed to understand how the computer worked, you simply used the machine intuitively. Move the cursor around your virtual desktop and select what you want. It was that simple. And although the Macintosh didn't sell as well as Apple had hoped, it did prove that there was a better way to implement desktop operating systems. And that was with the graphical user interface. But Bill Gates, who recognized the Macintosh's significance, was troubled by just one thing. Why did Apple decide to keep the Mac's graphical user interface operating system for themselves? Why not license the OS to other computer manufacturers willing to pay for it? Then, not only will you make more money, but you'll also capture more market share. So Gates took it upon himself to create a competing operating system to Mac OS called Windows, which was released in 1985, which, it so happened, was the same year Steve Jobs resigned from Apple. So with the Macintosh experiencing sluggish sales due to its high price, Microsoft had the opportunity to overtake Apple, and that's exactly what happened over the following decade. Windows proved to be a huge success, with dozens of PC manufacturers purchasing licenses of the operating system to use in their hardware. By 1995, Microsoft was worth $6 billion, while Apple was on a slippery slope to bankruptcy. Windows had a virtual monopoly over the computer industry, with macOS accounting for just 4-5% of the market. Apple's desperation became very clear as they began licensing the Macintosh operating system to third-party manufacturers, similar to what Microsoft had been doing with Windows. But it was too little too late. Businesses and developers had already become entrenched in the Windows ecosystem and had very little incentive to switch to Mac OS. By 1996, the Macintosh was running on an operating system that hadn't been updated for five years. Despite multiple attempts at building a next-generation operating system, Apple had virtually nothing to show for it. That's why they turned to third-party companies for help, hoping to purchase an operating system that could be used in the next generation of Macintosh computers. And that's exactly what they found in Next Software, a company founded by Steve Jobs after he left Apple. Next had been developing an advanced object-oriented operating system that would provide Apple the foundation they needed to create a new OS for the Macintosh. So at the beginning of 1997, Apple acquired Next for $400 million, which also meant Steve Jobs would be back at Apple as a consultant. Five months later, macOS 8 was ready to be released. And if you're wondering how Apple was able to build a new operating system so quickly, it's because the initial release of macOS 8 wasn't much different from System 7. It featured a new Platinum user interface, a multi-threaded finder, and custom appearance themes, but the underlying technical aspects of the OS was largely unchanged. In fact, Apple's macOS 8 release was originally named macOS 7.7, .7, but Steve Jobs changed it in order to take advantage of a legal loophole that allowed Apple to stop licensing System 7 to third-party manufacturers and shut down the Mac clone market altogether. 
Response to Mac OS 8 was huge, with Apple selling 1.2 million copies in the first two weeks and 3 million within six months. This was in large part due to strong grassroots support among Mac users who understood Apple was in financial distress. This resulted in many users paying for the upgrade even if they didn't need it, as well as many pirate groups refusing to distribute the OS for free. Mac OS 8 was a very influential release, with features like an updated hierarchical file system that continued to be used until Mac OS High Sierra. But sales of Mac OS 8 definitely weren't enough to keep Apple afloat. They needed new hardware to bring in serious revenue. And that's exactly what they did in 1998 with the release of the iMac, which became Apple's most successful product launch in history at that point. But when it came to its operating system, there was sort of a mismatch. Because although Mac OS 9 was released a year after the iMac, it still featured an outdated user interface that stuck out like a sore thumb compared to the iMac's shiny, colorful design. And that's exactly what Apple addressed in 2001 with the transition from Mac OS 9 to Mac OS 10. Not only is this when Apple debuted their Aqua interface, which featured visual embellishments like reflections, shadows, and translucence, but this also began the tradition of Apple naming each version of macOS after a big cat, the first of which was called Cheetah. Now, macOS X Cheetah was a very important release since it marked the beginning of a new era for the Macintosh operating system. In fact, it was such a monumental transition that Apple held a funeral for macOS 9 on stage. But there were some problems with Cheetah. First, the Aqua interface, while visually appealing, was a resource hog causing system slowdowns and bogging down application performance. Not only that, but the new OS required more hard drive space which also caused longer boot times. Many users also noted the lack of basic features like DVD playback and CD burning which used to be available in Mac OS 9. So although Cheetah was a pleasure to look at, it certainly wasn't a pleasure to use, and the heavy criticism of the release caused Apple to offer their next version of Mac OS X to users for free, because at the time, upgrading to a new operating system used to cost about $130. Now, the following release, Puma was a step in the right direction and was praised for introducing many new features that were missing from Cheetah like CD and DVD burning, DVD playback support, support for more printers, and faster 3D performance, but was still criticized for failing to fix significant bugs that could cause system-wide crashes and failure to improve system performance. Jaguar was the next release, and it turned macOS X into a more refined and stable operating system. It was also the first time Apple incorporated the Jaguar name into the product's marketing, whose box featured a Jaguar fur logo. Now the following Panther, Tiger, Leopard, Snow Leopard, and Lion releases all followed the same patterns, introducing new features and system optimizations to keep the OS competitive. But there was a trend beginning with Mountain Lion that set macOS on a new path, and it was when Apple began introducing applications and elements from iOS to macOS, like Notes, Messages, Game Center, and Notification Center. And this trend only continued with each subsequent update. Mavericks featured desktop versions of iBooks and Maps, Yosemite featured Photos, Sierra featured Siri and Apple Pay, Mojave featured News, Stocks, Voice Memos, and Home, and Catalina features dedicated music and podcast apps, plus an Apple TV app, all of which were borrowed from iOS. Not to mention Apple's Project Catalyst, which is designed to help developers bring iOS and iPadOS apps to the Mac. But when it comes to Catalina, I do want to issue a warning that it no longer supports 32-bit apps. So if you're thinking about upgrading, I highly recommend using CleanMyMac X since it'll identify any 32-bit apps you may have so you'll know beforehand what applications won't work. Although keep in mind there may be updates for those 32-bit apps and you'll find out by using CleanMyMac's updater feature which will instantly replace your apps with 64-bit versions if they're available. It's also worth noting that I use CleanMyMac X because it's actually notarized by Apple, so to clean up your Mac before upgrading to Catalina, just click the link in the description and you'll be able to download a free trial of CleanMyMac X, or you can purchase a premium license for just $35, which is way cheaper in the long run compared to a subscription service. So anyway, Catalina does follow the trend of being influenced by iOS, and some have seen this as a sign that the two operating systems will someday merge into one, but I see it a different way. 
Just consider the environment of macOS back when it was first introduced compared to today. Back then, there were only desktop computers with desktop operating systems. Today, computers come in many form factors. Tablets, phones, watches, and desktops, each with their own optimized operating systems that borrow from one another. For example, iOS did music playback much better than iTunes on macOS, so it made sense to replace iTunes with a re-engineered music app that borrows many of its features and design cues from iOS. That doesn't mean the two operating systems will inevitably become the same thing, it simply means Apple is concerned with delivering the best user experience possible. We're only going to see more of this as time goes on, and I think it's for the best. Alright guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.